Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tech Talk, a podcast where Amit and I talk about all things tech. Today is another special episode because it's not just Amit and I. We have Boni and Dilip with us today uh, as guests. Uh, they are co-founders of Orcus, and uh, they're also somehow related to something called Netflix Conductor, which n- neither of these things I have no idea <laughs> what they are and really sort of interested to find out more about the the uh, product Orcus, which you guys have uh, built. And uh, it's, it's a sort of an area of technology where I didn't actually have any past um, experience. And I feel like it's a, quite a, a not a beginner level kind of technology. And it's used for bigger, big tech companies to sort of uh, help with their infrastructure as far as I understood with a quick Google. So uh, Boni and Dilip, thank you very much for joining our podcast. I'll hand it over to you guys to introduce yourself and also if you start with uh, what is Orcas. So uh, I'll start with uh, Boni purely from an alphabetic standpoint. Yeah, uh, thanks Amit, thanks for, not, uh, you know, for having us here. Uh, very excited to be here and talk about you know, Orcas, Netflix Conductor and all of that. Uh, a little bit about me, I'm uh, uh, basically a co-founder and CTO of Orcus. You know, I, I used to work at Netflix before this, which is where we first built uh, this product that we're going to talk about today called Netflix Conductor. Uh, it was built as an open source software, you know, which is now, uh, you know, supported by us as a company. Um, I have about 20 plus years uh, of experience as an engineer, uh, I, you know, I life longer uh, in a lifelong I've been an engineer I, I do a lot of things uh, in the current setup and I focus on the uh, the cloud infrastructure uh, the UI you know some backend engineering so all things uh, technology is what I take care of uh, in the company uh, and I'll let Dilip introduce himself uh, before you know I can give you a short introduction about what uh, Orcus and Netflix conductor is. Absolutely thanks. And first of all, thank you, Amit and Renat, uh, for hosting us. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, just a little bit over myself. So my name is Dilip. Uh, uh, I'm one of the co-founders and the chief product officer here at uh, Orcus. My background uh, started off as in, in engineering. I worked at uh, places like Microsoft and uh, AWS uh, you know, during the early days. Then moved into product management. Again, worked at you know those companies. And uh, one, of the, uh, one of the last jobs I had was at this company called Redfin. And, that's where like I really saw the power of conductor where like, you know, they were using the open source conductor and it just became the de facto standard for application building over there. And, uh, you know, uh, you know that that's when like, you know, we wanted to bring the power of this, uh, you know, application building pattern and this open source tooling into the hands of even more developers. So we started uh, Orcus together. And here, like, you know, I focus quite a bit on the product and the go-to-market and, you know, you know as with any startup, like, you know, anything and everything that's needed, right? So it's been a great journey. Uh, looking forward to telling like you, uh, you and your uh, audience all about like you know uh, how developers can build amazing applications using Conductor and Orcus and so on and so forth. All right, with that, I'll hand, maybe hand back to Boni to talk about like you know what is Conductor, what is Orcus, and like you know go from there. Yeah, thanks, Dilip. Um, so I guess Dilip kind of clu- you know, gave clues about what the platform is. Uh, but I think the best way to kind of tell you what it is is to tell the story of how it originated. Uh, you know, so as I mentioned earlier, this is something that we built when we were at Netflix, right? Uh, so I I was uh, part of this team uh, for the content platform um, infrastructure. Uh, you know, we, we were basically an engineering team that was uh, you know focused on helping engineers increase the productivity, you know, build applications faster, and all that. So this was uh, back in 2014, uh, 15, when we joined there, right? Uh, and the company was going through a big transformation because, uh, you know, all along we've been uh, streaming third-party content, uh, you know, content that are produced by, you know, studios like Paramount and and the likes, you know, Disney, for example. Uh, and Netflix kind of predicted that, you know, it won't be too long before these companies also built their own streaming services, which is which is what happened. Uh, right, so we need to be, uh, we need to start building or producing our own content. That was like, uh, that was something that they they figured out at that time or even before that, and they were pretty busy in kind of making that happen, right? And as part of making that happen, um, well, as as with everything Netflix, they wanted to be the biggest and the best at uh, you know the content production, uh, and also do it globally across all the countries. For example, 
these days, uh, you know, there is a lot of Korean content on Netflix. Uh, that's because, you know, there was uh, a few years back, they they set up this whole production process and hired studios and all of that to make that happen, you know, a few years back, right? So, uh, and my wife loves Korean shows and she's never going to stop subscribing to Netflix because- I, people... I have to also add that as soon as you said that, I my wife also watches those shows, which I have no idea what they are, but there you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the, the goal of, you know, producing a ton of content globally was, was the main thing that we were trying to help uh, solve for Netflix. So there was a lot of engineers in Netflix, you know, who was trying to make this happen. You know, when you think about content production like this podcast, for example, you know, there is the recording aspect and the post-production, you know, the you know, you're going to edit a few things out and, and make it into what you're going to publish out, right? And it's like the very basic aspect of content production. If you think about streaming studios uh, there are things like you know you have to start rating it you have to produce subtitles you have to dub audio you have to quality check the content you have to add vfx there's like ton of process that happens uh, you know in making a production successful so there was a lot of software that was being built in netflix to make all of these happen right and they were all there uh, for you to assemble for different productions different production processes for example uh, you know to make that happen and we were pretty good at building these core components what we found as an inefficiency at the time was a lot of time, you know, each country has specific processes to follow or different rules to follow. Uh, so there was there was this scenario where oftentimes engineers are spending a lot of time just assembling these pieces together in slightly different shapes and form to make it, uh, you know, make it happen for, for the company, right? And that was fairly redundant work uh, that was going on across, you know, each instance of this the same same kind of work was being done over and over again um and you know it, it was found to be found to be wasteful and we were asked like hey is there a way to to make this better another aspect of that was engineering is expensive right i, I think um it's always been expensive and back in that time you know the cost of engineering hires were going up pretty much drastically as well so the the company was not able to kind of just hey let's hire a ton more people to make this happen that was not an option uh, plus, uh, what engineers don't like is the fact that, you know, they end up uh, working a lot on doing things like when they when they have to do a lot of work on like, you know, error handling, managing the, the uh, transient uh, error nature of like network communication and things like that. Right? So, for example, when an API call is made to like a server or something, if that server is down, uh, you know, you have to retry it after a while or you know, when the server comes back up. Uh, these are things that are very painful to manage uh, and and write and, you know, control. So that was another aspect that we were uh, also thinking of uh, trying to manage. So combining that aspect of like, hey, how do you, uh, you know, very quickly uh, put together different pieces that you already have in your ecosystem to build a new flow and that too in a very reliable fashion uh, was the problem that we were trying to solve. And we, uh, you know, we thought of like, hey, what's the best way to think about this? Uh, and so, and this concept of an orchestra came up, right? And there is this orchestra where there's all these instruments being played by, you know, all these people, and there is a conductor who is actually orchestrating it, uh, you know, just telling what needs to happen at each each moment, right? That uh, we we sort of took that uh, model and thought, okay, we all we need to do is build an orchestration engine, um, which is basically uh, going to, was what is called a centrist conductor. And this conductor is where you can actually describe what the flow should be. Uh, and, you know, it can take care of orchestrating those complex flows, which meant that, you know, um, the engineers were able to put together flows really quickly uh, instead of having to handwrite it and, and waste a lot of cycles on it. They were able to kind of just configure what these flows are on top of the existing sort of uh, pieces that we had. And then this orchestration engine was powerful enough to take care of like different failure points where, you know, something is not working. It will wait for that to be fixed before it retries and things like that. Uh, so that orchestration engine is what we ended up building out, uh, which ended up, you know, uh, helping the teams to scale um, their output, go to market faster. You know, we were able to launch production processes in different countries really quickly. Um, and, you know, all of that innovation happened. And that's the background. That's the fundamental platform that we we are uh, you know pitching to engineers outside of Netflix as well now. You know, make use of this uh, and you know scale your output, uh, bring 
value to your business faster, uh, do it in a reliable fashion, do it at scale and all of that aspect. Yeah. Wow. So, <laughs> no, that is really good, actually. This is really good insight for me to understand. I, I understand where this sits in, in, in terms of uh, in a big tech stack for, of, a, of a big tech company. So uh, one of the things that really stood out in, in everything that you were saying is that there was a uh, sort of a, a scaling issue. So one of the main advantage of technology itself is that it it's it should be really easily scalable, but then you had a situation where there was a lot of redundancies and having to repeat the same kind of slightly different work and be able to identify the common grounds of all of those slightly different things and then you know put it together in a in a way that it, it is adaptable. I think that's a, like a, that's the secret sauce to a lot of uh, sort of successful startups and. Um, uh, yeah, it's, um, I'm really excited to know that uh, how how it all started. Thank you very much, Boni, for that uh, for that uh, insight. Now, um, as I was listening to it, I quickly sort of you know, I mean, given AI is one of the sort of the one of the popular topics nowadays. Uh, my mind quickly went to the sort of the how the data is generated and sort of preserved and whether you know the engine kind of creates a, 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 a large data set which can then potentially use to to train an AI system to potentially monitor uh, any kind of anomalies in future whether positive or negative is that is that something that is already there or are you guys working on yeah, yeah. I mean if you think about this uh uh, sorry, I'm going to pass to you soon. Like this, this whole idea is like, you know, automating your or flows, right? I think, Renat, your background is also in automation. So I think the idea is that, you know, the orchestrator can be configured to do like 15, 20 steps, you know, whatever that you normally have to do uh, by hand. Even those things can be configured as a flow and ask, uh, you know, you can ask the orchestrator to orchestrate that flow. And if you kind of automate a lot of these functionalities in your company that, that your company needs to operate as a business, right? All of that uh, is is essentially a lot of data that is coming through. You know, those execution history. You know, where time is being spent in different uh, aspects of your workflow, and all of that is data that we we this orchestration engine is is seeing, and it can be collected. And then this can be obviously automated to find out, uh, obviously mined to find out where the pain points are. You know, where the where there is a potential way to shortcut the process and make the process more optimal. Uh, and you know, all of that aspects are are available to uh, people who are using a, an orchestration agent. And I think Dilip might have a few things to add as well. Uh, it's very similar point to what you just said, Boni. And like I would add one thing is that structurally, like the orchestration pattern has like a good uh, differentiation compared to like the other you know ways in which you can build an application because this orchestrator is like you know situated central and it has visibility to like you know all the components that you know, make up the application, right? So typically in a distributed system, things are all over the place. Like, you know, one thing could be a microservice in Java in AWS. The other one could be like a C-sharp legacy platform on your data center. The orchestrator by its nature knows, it can see all of this and it can ingest all this data. And like what Boni was saying, like with this very unique perspective and all the data that's associated with it, it can look at and like, you know, start like, you know, leveraging AI uh, models to see like, you know, what are the pressure areas? Maybe there's this, you know, purchase, you know, uh, shopping cart purchase application where like you can see that the call to the payment instrument is the one that's slowing down or like taking the longest, right? So there's a lot of possibilities there with the data that's, uh, you know, that, that's being observed, uh, you know, in this, uh, in this uh, situation. I was I was I was keen on understanding because um, we all watch Netflix and we all watch it on different devices. So I mean, when you have to format, especially like a podcast like us, uh, people will watch it on different devices. People will hear it. People will uh, listen to it. And you were talking about post production for multiple uh, device formats. So you have to store all that data, and then as uh, Dilip was mentioning, different technologies on different. Uh, 
what do you say blocks so can i define can i say those uh, that those blocks are containers and then you are trying to orchestrate because uh, one of the things when i was uh, researching about orchest was that it manages uh, microservices so so there are different services that are managing different uh, parts of the application say billing application uh, billing part and then my account and then logging and uh, etc so these are the different parts um and in technology um so we both work in technology and from what we know is that you have containers and you can uh, start a container on demand destroy it if you need it and then uh, you also have kubernetes which is a similar uh, which is like a container orchestration so i was trying to uh, understand netflix conductor uh, in parallel to kubernetes but when i try to research more i could not see a parallel i think there is a difference so could you explain yeah. pos possibly the difference because you have these microservices and then you have kubernetes and now you have netflix <laughs> conductor which is i think very different from kubernetes so i think that will be also interesting to know about yeah of course yeah for sure i mean i think you you kind of uh, that's sort of probably a good use case that we could uh, use to walk through this difference uh, it's definitely different uh, kubernetes is for like you know launching services containers jobs and you know it can take care of like using resources optimally and all of that uh, while netflix conductor is basically an abstraction above it right like it's for your business functions your your uh, back end processes your system uh, you know the stuff that you have to otherwise write a lot a lot of code for is what we kind of help orchestrate through uh, and this uh, this thing that you mentioned right like in during uh, like a content is produced usually you distribute it across different channels uh some different devices and each of them has a different encoding requirement uh sometimes it's just different bit rates and all of that um uh, yeah so you know you, if you think about it you have the master file right that you recorded and then uh, you may do your edits and you still produce like a final sort of high quality cut and then you want to now uh start processing this typically what this means is you kind of take that file you chunk it up into smaller pieces uh, and then you distribute it to a sort of a cloud computing farm where each of those chunks is processed independently where you produce all the different variants uh different encodes you know that that is going to be supported on different devices and then you eventually upload it to some sort of distribution network uh and then there is an algorithm that runs on your player or uh you know or your, on your edge endpoint where the player talks to where this will kind of tell you Uh, it'll kind of tell the player that here is the chunks that you need to play in this sequence right that's typically the flow and if you think about that that entire process is what you can orchestrate using conductor say the first step is taking that big file and putting it in a place where you can start chunking it out to small pieces that's one piece and that might be done using like a service called as let's say let's call it like media file cutter or something like that right it'll just reduce it into small pieces and store it in a location and it knows the location and it'll pass it on to the next step which is probably the step which encodes into some kind of master encode format right so it takes each of those chunks now if you think about it a large say 4 gb content could have been split into like uh, you know uh, 8 500 mb uh, pieces or like yeah. all, all the way to like 20 mb pieces right whichever is most optimal for your computing um, farm to deal with Uh, so for each of those that could be done in parallel right to speed up the process and that that is a process that netflix conductor can help you orchestrate you can just say hey fork out uh, 2000 processes and process each of these file across those 2000 processes now this is where conductor could potentially interact with your kubernetes cluster to say launch 2000 containers for me uh, okay and process those uh, 2000 chunks right So that's where the, the, that abstraction is sitting on top of uh, Kubernetes and talking to Kubernetes and making that happen. And once these chunks are produced, um, I mean, first level of encoding is done. You can, you know, do further processing all the way up to like you are pushing it to the CDN. All of these could be steps in that forked process. So you know, you just two uh, thousand x your speed in which you can produce that. uh contents final distribution pieces onto the cdn right because you parallelly processed now if you had to ask an engineer to kind of build this out of hand it will take a lot of time and effort to to kind of build that framework that state management of distributing work across 2000 instances uh and all of that but the individual pieces itself is going to be really easy to write like hey yeah. take use ffmpeg and convert to some new format those kind of things are pretty easy to put together but the whole 
distributed uh, uh, networking and computing is where the challenge is and could take the most amount of time. And that's where, you know, Netflix conductor can take care of those things and you don't have to worry about that because it's been done, uh, you know, it, when we built Netflix conductor, we had to worry about all those things. We had to build a framework that made all those things happen smoothly. It went through years of, you know, battle hardening in companies like Netflix, you know, to make it where it is. So the goal is like, let's reuse that battle hardened, uh, you know, infrastructure software to kind of make these complex distributed distributed flows, you know, uh, run run at scale and reliably. So wow. So another, so, another yeah. question I have, uh, yeah, and maybe Dilip or Boni, whoever can answer. So you talked mm-hmm. about um, like. Um, an abstraction layer above Kubernetes uh, that's uh, defining the workflow and making sure that all the all the things are uh, working as defined in the workflow. So if if I'm if I'm someone who doesn't understand technology, let's say for example, so are these workflows um, um, executing uh, every single time uh, when a content is uh, uh, requested by a customer, or they are uh, executed only when the content is being processed or content is being like uh, formatted, etc. Uh, so it's, uh, I mean, the workflow is invoked only once because I, I'm assuming it's like uh, some workflows are executed once and some workflows are executed multiple times, <laughs> depending upon the workflow that is being defined, right? Yeah. So just yeah. wanted your insight on that. Yeah, basically, I mean, like, you know, like you're saying, like, once you define a workflow, you know, these are the steps that needs to be done, right? Like, there are multiple ways in which, like, a workflow can be started, and it really depends on, like, the way, you know, uh, the application's logic is, right? One is that, like, you can call, like, a REST API call to conductor to say, this workflow started, right? And then it goes through. Uh, another one is, like, you know, uh, conductor can lis- listen to an event queue so that, like, you know, if an event is returned there, maybe somebody made a purchase, or like maybe a new file was like uploaded into like your content repository and that triggered an event conductor and read that and start the workflow to pro- start processing that right and one of the cool features that like we added recently to conductor is the ability to run workflows on a schedule so basically this means that like every 5 minutes run this workflow and that workflow could be like you know go check and see if there's new content then process it and you control how often that runs and you can see all the results of each of the ex- execution runs and then we also have seen customers using like another pattern where there's like a, a primary workflow that starts and then like, you know, think of it as like subscription uh, billing, right? Like every 30th of the month or the first of the month, you want to charge a payment instrument. You can start the workflow, the workflow does all the steps, then it waits till the next month, right? That's one of the key features here is that like any workflows that you have written here, they are the executions of those are very durable in the sense that like you know some of the workflows might like finish in like one second some might like finish in like you know 30 days one year even longer right so to kind of like summarize and answer your question right like so a workflow once once defined can be started in multiple different ways depending on like you know how the application developer wants it to be like you know start Right, right. Sorry, I, 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 one of the things that really sort of I, interests me is to find out emerging technologies and how they fusion together. And one of the things that um, I wanted to sort of understand whether you guys have any plans for is the uh, emerging technology of uh, VR, AR and VR. So uh, virtual reality is kind of was there uh, if, if, since few years, but it everyone thought it would be very popular, but it hasn't yet. But I, I, I still think that there will come a time when that would be a very commonplace of, of a way to consume content because of the of the detail that uh, that it offers. Now, um, streaming services like Netflix, I'm sure they have you know uh, plans to sort of uh, accommodate all different kinds of uh, VR and AR sort of content that might be might be consumed by viewers later uh, and already does I think uh, to a degree how does the current technology how is it prepared for handling that kind of uh, interactive AR VR content if it comes to it in future yeah, that's a great question. And uh, actually, one of my uh, favorite ways to watch Netflix today these days is like also on like on VR, you know, because it has uh, a theater effect where the whole content can be streamed like a, in a theater like setting. 
and you can watch it lying down if you will if you want uh, it's a pretty interesting uh, this has been there for for a long time in oculus at least uh, you know so every now and then i try to watch some stuff uh, that way if you haven't tried it you should try it it's it's really great uh, the feeling uh, only thing is it's just hard to put on the headset for that long sometimes but like to watch a movie it works out really great uh the uh, and the question about like whether conductor or orcus you know plays a part in it i think we we're definitely able to help companies who are building on ar and vr you know to scale up their engineering uh, to make those content production faster right like to if you think about um even uh, we have users that you know um manages their workflows on the ui meaning like there are multi step actions that a user has to take and it's conditional and all of that they've kind of mapped it to a workflow and help users navigate uh-huh. so for interactive content you could definitely use like a flow definition to to keep track of what so when the user starts playing you know start a workflow in the background and then uh, you know as the user selects different um reaches different moments and if you have to choose different uh paths to go or for example those kind of things right you can manage it as a flow definition and help uh, leverage conductor to kind of ma- uh, to to map that journey and this is pretty powerful because otherwise you have to build all of that logic and you know kind of map that out in, in your own code which can take a lot of time uh and and on the other hand like if you go back to the infrastructure elements like you know content production process uh with uh, with at least for interactive content you know usually a one hour long movie effectively is 16 hours because you know they have to uh, they have to uh, shoot all the different uh, parts the user could take and and then you know imagine like the the process optimizations that you can get by using a tool like conductor to to kind of encode that large content or uh, even things like managing just the production process for that large content can be optimal with an orchestration framework so yeah they, that's where we think you know we think conductor will be leveraged more um, because it's natively a, a very plain platform that you can leverage in whatever aspect you, uh, you know uh, that you want to uh, leverage it for right meaning like optimizing engineering uh, resources you know handling things reliably and all of that aspect where we think we play a better part in like um using emerging emerging technologies is generative ai uh, right like obviously language understanding is a is a huge innovation that has recently happened and has been so many companies that has come out of that um and we have been trying to make sure you know uh, one of the challenges that oftentimes when we talk to like companies is like hey i know this to this concept this technology is great like generative ai uh, how do i use this in my business right like how do i how can i how can my engineers kind of plug this into different areas uh, and there's a lot of there's there's still companies being built out to kind of help out and just in that process alone but we think it's just an orchestration problem you know it's like one more um, musical instrument that the conductor has to orchestrate right and we can help uh, embed you know generative ai functionality into your application really really effectively uh, because it can not only do simple sort of direct one to one interaction one one interaction but like you can have a multi step interaction flow where you have six six or seven models that you want to ask the same question to and then figure out what's the best answer and you know this whole retrieval uh, augment augmentation of uh, um generative ai concepts right those things you can actually implement using the orchestrator out of the box right it can really distribute your questions across different model and and you know get the answers and all those aspects can be done really really quickly uh using an orchestration framework like conductor which is where i think immediately we'll have a, an impact on uh when it comes to emerging technologies and dilip i don't know if you want to add a few things about those things no i mean uh, yeah basically like uh, what what bodhi was covering earlier like we are solving the problem where like the businesses all across the world are looking at gen ai power their applications and this is where like you can uh, you know natively do that using an uh, orchestrator like conductor so uh, i mean uh, while while you guys are talking i thought okay there are other applications right of these workflows uh, because you can use the workflows not for 
content but also for say banking application because they have a lot of workflows right they have uh, statements to produce and they have to uh, direct debits are there uh, we are based out of uk so we have monthly direct debits so there are a lot of uh, workflows that can be defined so user sign ups yeah. especially in fintech because for fintech the uh, the platforms have to scale up very quickly so they start with like few users and then if it becomes viral then everyone starts using it so have you had have you had customers uh, from the finance industry who are leveraging say conductor for uh, these workflows absolutely like in fact like you know uh, fintech like you know what we call it like bfsi banking financial services insurance right that's like one of the key uh, verticals that like where we are seeing like you know both uh, open source usage as well as like you know uh, orcas usage right like the enterprise product so you know for example like you know there are banks like jpmc and amex here in the us like you know that are, that have been long time conductor users what they do is like you know banking applications uh, one of the uh, one of the one of the things that you'll start noticing when you talk to customers is that like it's very complex like there's so many variations there's so yeah. many like if else like so the modeling of the business logic usually becomes very uh, gnarly you know when you're like using the traditional methods that's where this pattern and like the you know the the, the way conductor mo uh, helps you model applications like really shines right so you know that makes it like very uh, attractive for like you know banking customers and like you know, uh, the other thing is like you know, banks and uh, financial institu institutions needs like extreme levels of observability. They want to be able to track back like at the, each transaction level what happened, you know, where did it fail, like you know, which machine it was running, and that's something else like in that's built into Conductor. Like you know, when you're orchestrating a workflow, each execution can be tracked. You can see like among a million executions, three of them fail. Go exactly find where it failed. This box is the one that failed. So which machine it was running, right? Uh, so this modeling benefit, you know, this observability, and the third thing I would say, <clears throat> a lot of our banking, uh, you know, developers and customers love is the fact that you can run things at scale, right? Yeah. So you know, you as a developer, you're focused on like in implementing your business logic, making sure like you know, that's like you know, uh, conforms to what like the business needs, and the rest of it, like you know, scaling comes out of the box. You can start by running it like hundred times uh, or like a you know billion times a month, right? So that makes it kind of like pretty attractive for a lot of financial ind industries. And they have been, interestingly, one of the early adopters or like the early champions of uh, using uh, a conductor. Interesting, interesting. And uh, right. another, another, another thing that I was thinking about because, uh, uh, I mean, uh, this... Um the way of managing different things uh, workflow definition is now very common with different types of software right zapier zapier does it if this then that they also do it so what was the inspiration behind going with these workflow strategy was there like a software or was there already something existing in the market that you saw that inspired you to go with this workflow system and automating it because uh, rina does uh, ui path automation and in that also he has to define workflows okay uh, there is a file here go pick it up check uh, frequently and that's how we met uh, i was testing oh. his code <laughs> and uh, we were we were working on uh, different types of workflows like uh, picking up files from a location processing the files and other things so what was the inspiration behind this workflow kind of uh, approach for uh, managing these kind of uh, i mean applications yeah so this goes back to the the netflix origin story that i was talking about right like i think we also saw that opportunity like everybody was doing very very similar things in you know, all of these different steps that you need to um to to kind of assemble together you know to come up with new flows so naturally that was uh that was leading us to like a workflow model i think the only question was like hey can this scale uh or is this like a, a limited use case scenario where you can use it like 100 times per day max you know because it's complex to manage and all of that. So that's what we solved with the with the technology that we have. Like you know, you can run like billions of executions per day. So you can even handle like a small event that is coming through uh, from an IoT device, uh, you know, onto your servers. Um, and you know, if you think about IoT devices, it's it's going to be like many many uh, millions or hundreds of you know devices sending hundreds of events uh, every day, right? Uh, and that could scale to like very, very large amounts. And even for such use cases, we wanted to be able to use this concept of workflow. So imagine like the convenience you had in using technologies like Zapier or UiPath, but, you know, doing that at, uh, for every aspect of like, you know, backend engineering, right? That's really the theme that we thought 
you know, that inspired us and it proved out to be very, very valuable in terms of scaling engineering. And I think it's also going to be the new way of building applications. Uh, I think there has been a gap where these things have proved out in like uh, your, uh, you know, business analyst kind of use cases where Zapiers and uh, things like that can actually solve it really effectively. But, you know, the... Uh, I think what held back uh, engineers from adopting the same concept was lack of like a good framework like ours that can prove that it can run at scale, right? Because you need to be able to deal with a lot more uh, requests than um, what you typically expect uh, a traditional sort of VPM and engine or business process engine or workflow engines can deal with. And that's what I think we we can uh, offer to engineers and and they can apply the same benefits like, uh, you know, of quickly putting together solutions in business cases into like almost every backend aspects of your, uh, you know, your company's business, right? And thereby scaling it and going to market faster. Yeah. Right, right. So what about direct competitions? Now, do you, is, are there any other uh, companies or products which are directly doing the same or very similar things as, as you guys are, or is it just a complete monopoly right now? <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, so, you know, this is still like a very fast growing, like, you know, uh, segment, right? Like it's a new category of like, you know, you know how, uh, of engineering uh, product, right? So what I would say is like, what we have seen is like most of the customers, right? Like that we have, they are coming from like, you know, homegrown systems where like, you know, they have tried to like, you know, orchestrate or like, you know, do things like in a uh, choreographed pattern where like they're having each microservice talk to each other and kind of like try to build like quorum based decisions, things like that. And, you know, now they're like, you know, starting to, you know, when they are scaling, they're starting to see the uh, effects of that, like, you know, bursting at the seams or whatever you want to call it. And that's when they start looking at like, hey, what is like a great open source tooling, you know, that has, you know, solved this thing, like, you know, you know, and that's when they typically find out a conductor, you know, that, that came out of Netflix, right? So I would say that's the biggest category. But then we also have like, you know, uh, customers who are coming from the more, traditional BPM and uh, type of solutions. Like I think Boni kind of mentioned briefly how they are different from what we are doing. Like, you know, ours is more developer first, developer centric. So, you know, one one great way when we explain this product to like, you know, people is that like, if you are a developer, the first thing you start doing when you have an idea is that you go to a whiteboard and you start drawing it out, right? Like, so you have the different construct, like talk to this queue, like, you know, or like wait for this webhook, et cetera, right? What, Conductor does is that it gives you the ability to model exactly that, right? Whereas like, you know, the traditional workflow systems have been more about like defining at like a more abstract level, whereas like, you know, here you're defining at like exactly the way a developer would be thinking, right? So we do have like, you know, customers coming from that as well. <clears throat> but in general, like I would say like the vast majority of customers are coming from homegrown uh, solutions when they're trying to do application modernization to handle like, you know, more complexity in there business logic or to handle the scale requirements, uh, that's when they start looking at, uh, you know, conductor and, you know, potentially orcas as well. Okay. And uh, so, I mean, the the other 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 repetitive thing that has uh, kept coming during this podcast is orcas can handle everything at scale. But in order to manage everything at scale, you'll have to keep a track of all the different aspects, right? So does it require a lot of computing power? Does it require a lot of storage? What are the like the uh, computing requirements? So if a business wants to run and uh, does it uh, does it apply to small startups or can you take this software to just big businesses who are having problems at scale? Because from, from what we have spoken so far, I think workflow abstraction can be applied anywhere. Um, uh, it can be done even for a small startup and I think it will be much beneficial because then when they have to scale, they can scale up very quickly because they already have the workflows defined. So uh, like, yeah, what are the requirements if someone wants to run this? Yeah. So anyone who is actually building like, you know, cloud native applications, uh, you know, Conductor is a great, great uh, uh, application server for that, right? In, in it's it's able to execute all the flows that you define and it acts as a server for your or for your business cases and can be uh, hundreds per day to like billions per day you know depending on the scale requirements you have so we we are uh, not trying to focus on like large scale alone in fact you know most people uh, are dealing with you know simple stuff smaller stuff you know and even those cases you know we can come in and help to rapidly innovate you know rapidly put together the flows manage different variants for example 
um, there is a use case one of our customers use it for, which is to fill up, um, you know, state specific forms, uh, you know, for tax reasons and all of that. So it's it's again same thing, uh, similar things across fifty different states with slightly different flows, right? And for them to scale like a platform like Connector is ideal because you don't want to build that fifty different variants of the same thing and deploy it and manage it. Instead, they build all the pieces that is relevant and kind of assemble it together and then deploy it on Connector as a server, which takes care of orchestrating through that. So scale is uh, like uh, we are trying to cover even the smallest aspect, which we think um, of as high value workflows, right? like each instance is of material impact. And then to like large scale where it's more like, okay, processing an event. Uh, so there is some give and take that you you do to make the, the cluster design for the high value versus like high scale. Uh, and that's uh, like the different variants of our software, uh, like our installation that we offer to clients, right? And uh, when it comes to, uh, yeah, I think that was your question. So, you know, it, it's intended for like small scale to large scale. And uh, for small scale, you obviously don't need ex uh, extra computing power. You know, it, it basically it's configured in such a way that it'll run reliably, but using limited resources. And, uh, and on the other hand, when you want to scale it up, uh, because it's sort of only scalable, you know, we kind of just uh, increase the resources that is used by the system to take care of that high scale. And depending on the compromises you take, uh, based on the value of the workflow, you can. Uh, there are knobs and levers that you can adjust that can optimize cost and uh, you know bring savings as well. So, is yeah. it similar to like cloud computing? Do you do you host your application on a cloud server for a business and then it works uh, on AWS, Azure, and uh, Google Cloud? So does it work in that model? Yes, very similar to that, like in the sense that like, you know, so the contact, the open source conductor, right, the, from Netflix is like a framework, like, you know, you are in the, or anybody can go to GitHub, download it, and they can run it. And to run that, you need to have computing infrastructure, like, you know, you can run it on your, even your laptop, like the entire thing, or you can scale it up in the cloud. What we offer is like, you know, from Orcus is like, you know, uh, a way to make it even easier for engineering teams, right? So. We, instead of like you having to build the thing from scratch and maintain it, the open source, what we do is that we take it and we deliver it as a cloud service. And the, so we call this clusters, right? Like the Orcus conductor clusters. And, you know, they also have some enterprise features that are not in open source, but mostly, uh, you know, what we do is that like, uh, you know, this is built and all the infrastructure components, like, you know, we have the recommended settings and you as a customer can come in and say, hey, I want an Orcus conductor cluster in AWS uh, in this particular region. And you can, you know, this is a full, fully automated and this cl cluster will be created for you. And, you know, you'll be given the secure access credentials to do that. So what we say is that like, as developers, you can focus on building on conductor versus building conductor and maintaining it, right? So it's a, uh, it's a, it's a SaaS service that way. Get it. And one of, the, one of the interesting variations of that is that a lot of times our customers, especially in the banking or like more regulated industries, they like to they like this uh, fully managed cloud model, but they want the compute and data on their cloud premise. So we have a model where, like, we you know, customer can decide, like, hey, I, I want this cluster, but I want it to run it on my Azure account, right? So we still manage it, but we don't see any of the data or compute. So that gives like the perfect, uh, I wouldn't say perfect, but that gives a nice balance between like you know having the manageability of a cloud product, but like still having the data and compute uh, remaining with your uh, within your ecosystem. So um, do you guys uh, uh, handle the whole of the implementation of it if, 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 uh, for a company or is there a, like a, um, a particular set of skills a developer need to have to be able to sort of integrate it with their current system? And is there like a academy or certification that you guys also provide for uh, particular developers who wants to kind of be able to do this whole handling and integration part of it how does that work well that's a that's a great question i think you know uh, when you come to adopting new technologies this is the first question any sort of leader in the company would have right how much uh, like what is the talent uh, how much is my own team going to be able to do and how many more people we need to hire to kind of uh, uh, do this i think this is where you know connector really stands out because it's a very simple concept. It's a very simple architecture. Uh, it's it's what you would do if you, as an engineer, were asked to do this, like, you know, create a framework like this. It's all about like, okay, let's think about how we automate things. Automating things means like running um, different steps, right? 
uh, how do I put together these steps? Uh, it can be as simple as a sequential set of steps or, you know, the conditional things and forked process and all of that. So the, the concept itself is very much similar to like any other programming language. The whole workflows run, uh, you know, the, the code um, almost similar to like a programming language. You can have like if else conditions, for loops, you know, the standard uh, constructs that you need uh, to, to build that you typically use in your uh, programming language. That's exactly how Conductor is defined. Uh, it's really simple for someone to pick it up, meaning uh, a developer who is who is who is trying to onboard a workflow onto it. You probably can pick it up in 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 a day, you know, to to understand the concepts and and kind of put together the workflow. And as soon as they are done with their first, uh, usually that means everything else uh, will follow through very quickly. So we we think that is is really easy for like existing developers to just pick it up and run with it. And that's what we've seen across most of our uh, user base, you know, they they've discovered it. Initially, they had a lot of questions and how this works. And once they understand that, okay, it orchestrates different steps, and these steps can be defined just like a programming language. It's then the question is like, what does the step definition looks like? So the, there's detailed documentations that we have for that. So you know, you are writing um, a step where you're doing a condition, right? That's an if else condition. So how does if else look like in conductor? And you see that as a as a documentation, and you can start using it. And you become very familiar with it, so it's it's faster than learning a new language, in my opinion, because it's it's, it's just very close to like um, uh, your the language you're probably already familiar with. I know because it's that's how it's it's done. Yeah, so we think uh, there's no need to hire new people. Uh, if anything, you know, it's easy for your engineers to train up very very quickly. Right. Okay. So that's that's actually, I think, a, a very big selling point anyway, because that is true. Yeah, exactly. I mean, any company, whoever is sort of listening to a pitch for a new product, that's one of the things that one of the worrying things that they have to think of that are the guys that I already have, are they, are they going to be able to pick it up quickly or is there more investment like side investments needed? And yeah. if there isn't, that's, I think... Um, a lot of the times in, in for a lot of startups, this is a defining criteria. How easy to use is it for the user? I know obviously in, in this case, the user is the developer, but yeah, it, it, you know, for them, it needs to be very easy to sort of understand and implement uh, for, for it to be successful. And I, I think there are a lot of chatbots out there as well, but as soon as ChatGPT came, um, became live, one of the reasons it was so popular is that it was easy for, uh, you know, it, it, even if you didn't know prompt engineering or, you know, intricacies of how it works in the background, it could just be a human and get a, like a meaningful result. And that that usability plays a big role for any startups, and uh, I think that's one of your uh, USPs. If 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 I got it right, um, is there any anything else like what you consider to be an USP, which is you know no one else is doing, but you guys offer something that is that is a big selling point for your product? Yeah, um, I think. Um... The whole, I Dilip kind of mentioned it earlier, right? So typically engineers, you ask them to solve a problem or or just not just engineers for anyone, right? Most likely if you have access to like a whiteboard, like I have, you go and uh, draw out what the steps are, you know, how things will connect to each other. And I think the concept that we offer, I mean, there are other, most of the other tools also have the visual elements uh, into some capacity. But really, I think where we stand out is, you know, you kind of model your flows exactly how it looks like on your whiteboard. Um, and even uh, and each of those, uh, each of the executions of that particular definition is also represented in that same diagram. So, you know, um, as engineers churn in and out of your company, for example, you know, they get promoted and they leave the project and someone else comes on to manage it or some new new person completely came, uh, you know, this project was uh, shelved for a while and somebody comes back and revives it. This, these things often happen in different companies. And if it's modeled on conductor, it's visual, it's right there in front of you. It's a living running documentation for your platform uh, or for your business, uh, you know, software that, that anybody can pick up and understand, uh, you know, how things work. Uh, and it's not like you read a design doc that was written, um, 
uh, a long back and it's completely uh, disconnected from the actual system, which is often the case in many, many, uh, you know, many, many softwares like this or in companies, right? So we, we kind of avoid that problem uh, natively, you know, because of the visual aspect. Um, so not only you can model it visually, you can run it visually and all of that. At the same time, you know, you can still model the same workflows using code if you want to, because, you know, there are times when you want to work in your own IDEs to, to kind of frame this up. But even then that's visually, it's translated to a visual model and then ongoing maintenance can be done uh, in a visual aspect. I think that stands out as a key key element. It really comes through uh, once you start running it for a while, right? In a banking use case, for example, you're dealing with uh, hundreds of thousands of transfers per day. And one day a customer calls and asks, what happened to my transfer? It's so easy to just kind of go to the dashboard, look up that particular workflow instance and see that it got stuck maybe um, dealing with um, a payment uh, fraud check or something. Like uh, I have this use case uh, that just happened. I was uh, booking a flight for one of my colleagues to travel. Uh, and this airline has this concept called as a fair lock mechanism where, you know, you you book the, you, you got the fare, you can lock it for 14 days and then it'll automatically process the uh, fare after 14 days if you don't cancel it before that. So, you know, if you want to, if you're undecided, uh, you can use that and you can just pay a small fee for that. What happened was the 14 days passed and that did not happen. So I had to call and figure out what happened. I'm pretty sure there was some flow that was broken in the system, right? But instead, if you were to use conductor, you know, that 14 day waits and all is very easy to implement. It's visual. And when I called the customer service agent, they couldn't figure out what happened. And they had to reprocess the whole transaction uh, based on what I told them, based on the references I gave. But it'd be really easy if you were to use conductor because you have an dashboard, you search for my email, and they'll find that particular workflow and you can see where it got stuck. And you know, our there's our tooling has a lot of functions like retry, replay, these kind of things. So it would have been a button click to kind of resume that from whatever it failed in, uh, if, it, if it failed um, at all, right? And because our functionality has retries and other things built in, so most likely it would never happen. But even if when it happens, you have easy access to kind of see what happened and resume and replay things from that point. So you think, you know, this is the new way of building applications. Uh, and undoubtedly, you know, most people are discovering this uh, concept and discovering this way of building application. And once you start building through this, it's really hard to like go back and, you know, invest time in all the things that you know that a, a framework can take care of for you. And, you know, you're most likely going to stick with uh, the platform. Yeah, right. I think I think uh, it's it's a, a good selling point because w when we started this podcast, we had no idea, and now we're like, okay, what can we do with it? <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. You, you know what you should do? Like you should after this, maybe you and your audience to go to like play dot So it's like this free sandbox environment. Like you huh? know, everybody can log in. You can just go and create like a you know workflow. You can run it, and like you know, you have our, we have our documentation there. Yeah, the you know, uh, it's just a, play, a place for you to familiarize with this, you know, way of building applications. So strongly encourage you to check it out. Oh, yes, perfect. no, absolutely. No, I'm, I'm, I'm already so excited after knowing about this, and definitely, then this is, this is really nice to know that there is a sandbox environment, and also urge our audiences to sort of uh, check it out. Play dot orcas dot com. I'll, I will have the. Dot io sorry <laughs> we'll have the link in our description in in all of our platforms anyway so our audiences can check it out but i'm going to check it out today actually anyway because this is this is quite uh, quite interesting yeah, it's interesting because uh, renath has a lot of ideas and he keeps working on it and he uses a lot of uh, uh, robots ui path robots but he has to define all the workflow i mean he has to code all the things but now if he can just define the workflow, he'll take care of half of his work. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So we would love to see some of your work. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I I I I I am trying to, in a way, automate my life. Uh, so you know, make some sort of uh, um, investments, uh, trading investments, buying or selling some shares every day, as well as updating LinkedIn and Twitter posts, which are very simple things. But then you could also integrate a little bit of bigger things, like, for example, maintaining a sort of a, 
website of blog posts, which are sort of created based on the Google trend topics. So some of those things I am trying to automate, some of them are already live, but I didn't actually publish it uh, in terms of uh, in, in social media yet. But absolutely, we'll, we'll see how the whole thing can be orchestrated by Orcas. That, that, that's the whole thing about orchestrating. And I, I really like this, this thing about, you know, multiple things moving together and all of them are sort of being tracked in one unified place and you can control every all the moving parts from one place this this the whole idea of this really fascinates me and i'm really sort of uh, uh interested to check it out and find out more about it now um you know for our audience this might be a little bit technically advanced for for our usual audience but i do urge our audience to please do reach out if you guys have any a uh, question or anything that you guys would like to uh, know further i think we can uh, you know have those questions redirected to you guys if it comes to it as well as also please do um uh, sort of uh, interact uh, there is the the link that you guys will have in the description in the sandbox environment that is really good good uh, good place to sort of i, I would imagine start and um Definitely ask us any question, and uh, we'll try our best to answer it. Now, as we as we wrap up this really, really fruitful and insightful conversation, do you guys have any sort of kind of last remarks or uh, anything you'd like to sort of share with our audience? No, I mean, like I think we covered a lot of good good points, but like you know, we, we are always like you know innovating on behalf of the community and our uh, customers, so. But, uh, you know, uh, if anybody has any questions, we'll always be happy to, like, address those. Uh, but, like, yeah, you know, uh, stay tuned. You know, we'll be, you know, we'll be shipping more and we'll be shipping often. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Just, just to add something from my end, I'm, I'm pretty sure, you know, you're all, uh, the audience, you know, the uh, all of you are part of companies where, you know, the problems that we've described is, is pretty common. You know, go to going to market faster, bringing value to business faster. If you're... You know, I I strongly believe uh, you know using an orchestration platform is is the the best way to go about you know building new applications or new functionality. Even taking care of you know your existing applications, you could bring in an orchestrator to kind of um, you know do your new features faster. You know, uh, and other other aspects. So I think definitely check this out. Uh, you know, I think this is the new way of building applications for sure. Uh, and especially if you're thinking about new age technologies like generative AI and embedding all of those things, and Orchestrator can really simplify that, uh, you know, bring that technology into your ecosystem. So if you have questions, uh, reach out. Uh, I'm available on LinkedIn uh, or in our company Slack channel, which is public. Uh, happy to connect and talk to you about how we can help. Thanks. Thanks a lot, guys. I mean, it was really Perfect. insightful. I have a few questions, but I'll maybe <laughs> redirect them to you later <laughs> once I play with the platform. <laughs> For oh, sure, yeah. absolutely. No, this is this is really this is really nice to know that you guys have a public Slack channel as well. So having this kind of open uh, sort of culture to to open to public uh, with the sandbox environment and the public Slack channel, which is actually really nice. And uh, I would I would really encourage our audience to reach out and uh, uh, sort of engage with with this technology. If you guys didn't know about this technology already, hopefully this opened your eyes in in and a whole lot of possibilities and uh, we look forward to see see what happens next and uh, yeah so thank you thank you very much uh, Bonnie and Dilip so uh, you know to to let us know and they give us giving us the insights for this uh, product and uh, yeah we look look forward to the future yeah thank, thank you, you. Thank, thank you thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.